Welcome to the Beyond the Mat Podcast, an in-depth talk show discussing exclusively WWE topics. My name's Rick Boogs, and I came to rock with the Beyond the Mat Podcast that is beyond the M-A-T-T Podcast. Podcast! Podcast! Ah! All right, we're here for Beyond the Mat on July 12th, 2022. We're going to go over the July 11th episode of Monday Night Raw for the WWE. Before we get started in that, remind you guys to follow me on Twitter at BeyondMattWWE. Find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash beyondthemat, and we are available on all podcast and listening platforms. Follow us there. Leave us a five-star rating or review if you'd like to. And I would humbly introduce my guest now. Brad, how are you doing? Matt, it is great to be with you as always, man. All right. So we had a pretty decent episode of Raw, I thought, last night. You know, hear mixed reviews from the talking heads out there. But to me, I felt like, you know, it was a pretty good episode. Started out hot and heavy with Lesnar in the promo coming out there and... Having an exchange with Paul Heyman, Austin Theory got involved as well. We also saw Bianca Belair and Carmella have about a 15-minute match, about twice as long a match they had at Money in the Bank, and probably twice as good as a match as they had at Money in the Bank, but it ended in a countout. We saw Judgment Day come out and try to continue to recruit Dominic Mysterio. Rey Mysterio took on Finn Balor in a one-on-one match. Also saw Becky Lynch challenge Bianca Belair to a match at SummerSlam, so we'll see what happens with that. We had Ezekiel and AJ Styles take on Miz and Champa. Also saw Lashley. Saw Lashley and Riddle take on Theory and Seth Rollins in the main event. We also had a six-man tag match that involved the Street Profits and R-Truth versus Omos and the Usos. So, now I'll tell you what. It's nice to see R-Truth get mixed up with some uh, guys that are higher up on the card. You know, and he was pretty funny acting like he could be a referee, you know, doing... Acting out the count out, acting out the uh, three count and all that stuff. But overall, I thought it was a pretty good episode. What did you think of it? Man, I, I, I got to be honest. I thought it was one of the best episodes I've seen in a while. I thought it was really fast moving. I thought it was entertaining. There was a lot of like mixing up people in weird situations like you just referred to with our truth, you know, just weird kind of mashups that you're not expecting, whether that was Bobby Lashley and Riddle being together, whether it was Seth Rollins, you know, in theory being together, seeing Ezekiel come out and AJ Styles side. I mean, there was just a lot of like interesting kind of curveballs throughout almost every segment here. Um, even Alexa bliss and Oscar teaming up just a lot of cool little things that you weren't expecting that made it fun to me. Yep, Bliss and Asuka took on took on Dewdrop and Nikki A.S.H. and came away with the win there. We also had a surprise appearance from a very nicely dressed Dolph Ziggler came out to observe the main event, and he got himself involved in that main event, but we'll get to that a little bit later. We'll start off first with the Lesnar promo. He comes out and basically says that Roman Reigns is a tribal hog and that hogs get an ass whooping from him. And then we get get slaughtered. Yep. They get slaughtered and Heyman comes out and says, 
a lot of different things, but Lesnar says oink, oink, oink to him, and Heyman basically puts over the match at SummerSlam, says that Roman Reigns will be approaching 700 days, and that you will not break that record, and that you will see a very aggressive side of the tribal chief this time. Then we get Theory coming in and explaining how after he gets done with Lashley, he's going to cash in. Then you get Brock telling him to come down to the ring now. Theory says that he's going to have, a le after the life-altering match that Brock and Roman has, he's going to cash in then. He throws to the video monitor to remind us of getting thrown off the pod during the elimination chamber, which I thought was kind of weird because they showed it happening, but then they blacked out him crashing to the, the ground. Uh, did you notice yeah. that? Oh, of course. And the weird thing was like when theory hit the ground, he almost like just landed on his legs in that elimination chamber. Like he, he didn't just go flat to the ground like a like a you know like a rag doll type of thing. He kind of landed almost like sort of on his feet. I guess that's the only way you could take that bump without literally just dying. So it wasn't that violent looking. I don't. I guess they just didn't. They thought it would be too violent to show on TV rather than you know being on Peacock on a pay per view. I guess it's fine, but I don't know. I, I guess that's why. Well, it also could have been that the way that he landed made it look less violent and they'd rather just show him, you know, getting his head rammed into the glass on top of the pod and then thrown off it and then cut off of that. Yeah, you're right. Could have been both ways. But um, eventually Theory has Alpha Academy try to ambush Brock and Brock has his way with Gable and Otis. He ends up suplexing Gable all over the place. He threw him as far as he possibly could. At one point, he German suplexed him into the cameraman, which was a pretty cool visual. And then we had him pick up Otis and F5 him through the announce table to end the segment. So, you know, they start the show off with some destruction, get the crowd hyped up. You know, everybody likes to see that kind of Brock Lesnar destroying everything. So I enjoyed that. Uh, opening segment. I enjoyed the Heyman and Brock interaction. I think Heyman's doing a brilliant job of, you know, doing the talking for this feud and, and keeping it, making it feel like it matters and it's relevant. As much as we all know, this is the seventh time at least that the two of these guys are going to be facing each other. They're billing this as the last time, or at least it's going to be the last time until the next time. But I do think that this is going to be a, a big match. It's not going to be a 10-minute WrestleMania match. It's going to be a big match here. So Brock dominates Alpha Academy in this segment. Um, pretty entertaining behind the mic. Theory teased his cash-in. I think, now, with the theory and the cash-in thing, he's teasing it and teasing it and teasing it, and it's come, getting to the point where it's obvious and so a lot of times the obvious thing is not what they do but sometimes they make something so obvious that they know that you think it's so obvious they won't do it and then they do it so do you think okay. that we're getting in the situation where they're making it so obvious they're not going to do it or are they making it so obvious that we think oh it's too obvious and then they do it anyway I just can't see Theory being the champion, man. I mean, do you? No, I can't. Like I said, I, I see if any if he cashes in at SummerSlam, I see him cashing in and Brock Lesnar getting being the benefactor of it. If it makes it like a single championship match or something like that. They, 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 first of all, after what we saw in the main event, I don't see how uh, Theory's going to be prepared to be going after the undisputed, any kind of world championship. I think there's somebody in his way now other than Lashley. Um, and that's Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler came in and when 
Theory tried to pin Lashley at the end of the match, or tried to pin Riddle at the end of the match in a roll-up with his feet on the ropes. Ziggler got up and took his feet off the ropes. After the match, he super kicked him and demonstrated that he's now a baby face. I think anybody who beats the hell out of Theory is going to get cheered. Dolph Ziggler is a well-respected worker for a long time. I think people are happy to see him turn babyface. Has he been positioned high? No. But to me, if I'm Dolph Ziggler, I'm thinking, hey, pal, I've been here. I'm one of the longest tenured WWE superstars. You're not just going to go insert yourself in money in the bank and, and go win any championships before you go through me. Regardless if I've been down at NXT and not around for a little while, I'm back now. And so that's basically how I read what Ziggler did. But um, but what do you think about yeah. Ziggler in that match? I mean, I thought, I thought it was very unexpected and, and weird, obviously. Of course, we all thought it was unexpected that he came out. But um, yeah, um, I do think it's a way to involve Ziggler with Bobby Lashley and Theory and maybe have Theory get the U.S. championship belt back without you know, um, Lashley having to take a pin and we've seen that, you know, they don't really like to have Lashley take a loss. Like in the elimination chamber, he got knocked out with the concussion, um, didn't lose it. You know, um, I mean, when's the last time I, I, I guess he did lose to Omos, but Lashley doesn't lose too often. You know what I mean? No, I think Lashley, somebody they need and want to protect in theory being, somebody that they're trying to push here, they probably want to protect him as well. So if Ziggler gets himself involved in that U.S. title match, then he can take the pin for whoever wins and then protect the other one. So it makes sense. No doubt. It does make sense. And I, I don't know. I thought it was good to see Dolph. I mean, I like the fact that he's now, you know, on the good side, on the uh, baby face, whatever they call it. I like that. I like that, you know, it was just unexpected. And it went with the theme of the night where just unexpected things were happening left and right and right and left. It was really, to me, it's what made the show so interesting. Yep. So up next, we get Judgment Day versus the Mysterios. Mysterios enter first, then Priest and Balor come out. Priest tells everybody to rise. Nobody seems to really care. Balor then tells Ray he's not only a bad leader, but a bad fada. And Mysterio basically says he's had enough of that and then starts fighting with Balor here. We had nice... A couple spots in here. We had Ray hit a hur Hurricane Rana right into a nice cross body. Then later, Balor blocked the Hurricane Rana, hit a backbreaker, beat the hell out of Ray's neck. You know, there was a couple different spots where Balor was working particular body parts, which I like. He was working on the back first, and he started working on the leg. <clears throat> Eventually, Ray hits a dropkick, suicide die, and a sun sunset flip to the ringside area. Hurricane Rana off the top rope. Beautiful looking there. Goes for a cover, gets a near fall. Hits an Inseguri, then a 619. Goes to the top. Uh, misses a frog splash. Then Ray rolls up for Balor for two. Ray then hits a springboard head scissor, but gets reversed into the reverse DDT by Balor. Then Balor hits another reverse DDT. Gets up top for the coup de gras and pins Rey Mysterio. One, two, three. Dom then goes into the ring to console his father or pull his father out or whatever he's trying to do here. And Balor and Priest basically stalk him while he's doing that. Do you see Dominic joining Judgment Day? Or do you think this is just a way to make this feud sort of mean something? Because I don't see putting Dominic in Judgment Day as something that's going to help him. No, I don't see him joining judgment day, but what I, I do think it's creating a lot of suspense around the, what if, you know, what, like 
it, it just seems when Dominic's kind of looking up at them and, and everything that he's really being coerced and you could tell like there's a little small part of him that's thinking about, should I do it? But nah, I can't do that, which makes it, you know, kind of just a fun watch in my opinion. I, I, I really don't usually find the, the segments with the Mysterios that interesting. I really liked this man. I, I can't tell you exactly why. I just thought it was just, just very interesting to watch, and I didn't want to turn it off. I didn't want to fast forward through it. I thought it was great, and, and I think that part of why was the idea that Dom might, is he going to do it, is he not? But I, at the end of the day, I don't see him going to the dark side like that. Um, I, I do think it's going to propel the feud a little bit more where every time you're going to be thinking, is this the moment where he leaves to join for judgment day? And it doesn't ultimately happen. Yeah. It's going to be, I think it's just like you said, it's a, it's a way to add some fuel to the feud a little bit, make it a little more interesting. I don't think that Dominic going to the judgment day, is going to help him at all. It's not like there are some great, faction that's growing and just dominating everybody they're a mid to low card faction uh you know but i will say can i say though i thought priest was pretty damn good with his promo man i i maybe i'm missing something everyone thinks they suck or whatever but um i i found priest to be uh pretty good on the microphone and and pretty um um good with his words you know i i just thought he came across well tonight or last night yeah people are just giving priest in judgment day a hard time in general because oh how could you get rid of edge and replace him with balor okay listen edge didn't want to be in it anymore so they wrote him out of it get over it you know what i mean they're already playing vignettes for edge to come back with all these things from his past now i can tell you that what i've heard so he's going to come back as almost like a vigilante Batman character. He's going to start entering from the crowd again like he did when he first debuted as a baby face. He's going to come back as, and I think if they can get him back in by SummerSlam, that, well, no, they're not going to get him back in by SummerSlam, but I think at Clash of the Castle, he'll probably face Balor. Um, so, so, you, so you think he's going to be old edge but but explain to me where, where you think the character has sh shifts or, or where it's different from what it is the last time we saw edge as pre-judgment day he's gonna be more of a guy who who's almost like mysteriously helpful to people you know like batman you know what like, I'm saying? So, so kind of like, kind of like what Champa has been doing for Miz, but on the good side of things. Yeah, almost. Kind of like okay. that. Yeah. Okay. The way that he'll get back on TV is that something will be happening to somebody, like maybe even AJ Styles. Who the hell knows? But most likely the Mysterios, and he'll run in or something and beat the hell out of Judgment Day, and he'll come in from the crowd. He'll have some new gear and probably some sunglasses and shit like that. Um, he's not going back to the rated R superstar. It's like a whole new character, I think, but it's going to sort of have a lot to do with his past. You know, you've seen in these vignettes, all these different references to people that he's had feuds with before. You know, we even saw RKO shirts references feud with Orton. Surprised we haven't seen a Seth freaking Rollins uh, logo or something in there somewhere, but there's been Eddie Guerrero stuff, Kurt Angle stuff, Undertaker, Brood stuff, Christian, Hardy Boys, Dudley Boys, all kinds of references to people, but people still think it's Bray Wyatt. It's not Bray Wyatt, but um, <laughs> Edge is going to be coming back. That's what it's for, and I, I, I think that he'll eventually be facing Balor as his first feud, but I wonder if he could team up with Ray and take on Priest and Balor in a tag match, because that would be interesting too. Now, as far as Dominic goes, I don't think, I don't, it's not, I don't, I'm not telling you that uh, 
there was anything wrong with Priest promo. I just don't think Judgment Day in and of itself is over that well with the crowd. So why would you take a guy in Dominic who's not over and put him with something that isn't over? You know? Right. And I just think right now they're in a place where they just got to kind of roll with the punches of having him with Ray right now. But I do think it adds a dynamic have of him joining him with them standing over him and all that. But is it going to happen? I don't think so either. Moving yeah, on. I don't know, man. I like the Judgment Day thing. No problem with it. Yeah. I mean, some people hate, like it. Some people hate it. I'm in the middle. I don't really care anymore. I, I didn't like it when Edge was given 25-minute promos, you know, doing every single thing from cheap heat to – mountains of omnipotence and the, I don't know. I didn't like it with edge right now. I honestly think it's fine. I like Balor in that role. I like priest in that role. It's a shame that Rhea Ripley's not there, but, um, speaking of Rhea Ripley, did you see that Twitter picture? Yeah. Unbelievable. Wow. She looks so much different with looks like a different person. Yeah. We get Becky Lynch coming out. She says she hasn't gotten a rematch since WrestleMania. She wants she should be the number one contender, not Carmella, after beating Asuka for the millionth time. And she wants to have a championship match at SummerSlam. So Bianca Belair comes out for her Raw Women's title match against Carmella. This was a much better match than the one at Money in the Bank. Went nearly 15 minutes. Bianca Belair in a nice spot where she blocked the Hurricane Rana, turned it into a really nice looking stalling um, suplex. Carmella hit a nice looking cross body and she runs right into the turnbuckle, goes for another cross body. Belair catches her. That's where she hit the delay suplex. I'm sorry, the blocked Hurricane Rana was a backbreaker by Belair. Um, so we have. A glam slam here, reversed into a roll-up for two. So Carmella was bringing it here. She had some nice-looking spots. The, I, I really thought that the glam slam reversed into the roll-up was nice. And I also thought when Bianca was trying to take do the KOD out of the corner and oh, yeah. Carmella reversed into an X-Factor face buster, that was beautiful. That, I mean, Dude, this was a good freaking match, man. This was good. I... You know, it's almost like sacrilegious to say, oh, like Carmella wrestled really good, like, you know, to, according to a lot of the uh, community, you know, um, that, that you hear a lot of the haters. But, I mean, this was a good match no matter what. I, I, no one could convince me otherwise. Yeah, I mean, went for the KOD again and didn't get it. Yeah, I, I thought the KOD into the face buster spot was beautiful. I thought that Bel Air was doing some nice stuff, you know, catching the crossbody and going to delayed suplex with the marching and shit. Um, eventually, they get to the ringside area. Uh, Bianca Bel Air smashes Carmella into the ring post. She then goes to bring her back into the ring, rolls her in there. Be Becky Lynch runs over from the commentary table distracts Belair. Belair gets engaged in a conversation with the ref behind her, counting six, seven, eight, all the way to ten, and she loses by count out. Carmella wins. And you know, people were like, oh, well, this finish makes Bianca look stupid for losing by count out. Well, does it really? Because as the champion, losing by count out means match over. I get to keep my belt. Now, not a babyface tactic, but at the end of the day, Carmella's taking her to the limit here. She's reversing everything that she's throwing at her. So why is Belair an idiot for messing with Becky Lynch, who clearly has an axe to grind with her, and losing via DQ if it, all it means is that she still walks out as a champion? The only thing that this really means consequentially is that Carmella is probably still going to want to be involved in the title match, and it probably will be a triple threat at SummerSlam between Carmella, Lynch, and Belair, like I was saying last week. I like it, man. I mean, if Carmella can be that gritty, 
she had like a different side to her, man. It just wasn't like stupid stuff. Like she really was like acting like a real, you know, gritty wrestler, you know, she was good. So, um, I think I Corey no Graves does her a disservice on commentary. I think him, I mean, I get it. Like, you know, turn up the volume a little bit cause it's your wife. And, you know, we all know about them being on the show and all that. but I think him saying suppose beautiful woman and don't hit that face and all those other things. It makes you sort of take her differently. It makes me take her differently at least. And so then I don't necessarily appreciate her in-ring ability as much. And her in-ring ability last night was great. And I, and then people were like, oh, well, it was a throwaway Raw match. The Mysterio and Balor, that would have been a great match, you know, five years ago. But it's just a throwaway Raw match. No, it wasn't. It was a match. And it's going to be, they're probably going to have another one. Like, what, what do you mean a throwaway? What are you talking about? Throwaway for you if you're, this is the only Raw show you ever watched. But I don't know, man. I'm kind of going off about different things I've heard other people say because it's just like, I, I, I don't understand when people watch an episodic wrestling program and analyze it as if it, that show was the only episode they're ever airing. Yeah. I mean, those same people will tell you uh, that if they saw Tony Storm on SmackDown, they would tell you it's the uh, worst thing ever. And then when Tony Storm hits AEW, they'll tell you it's the best thing ever. You know, the same shit. So it's um, it, it's just to bash WWE, and a lot of people have fun doing that, and they like doing that. And certain people, you know, are are, are able to take it for what it is. And, and like you said, it's an episodic TV show that has a lot of different layers to it. Well, see, to me, the shame of it all is, it, you know, if you're a fan of AEW and you don't like WWE, that's fine. I haven't watched enough AEW to say that I'm a fan of AEW. I don't have a problem with AEW. I wouldn't, I'm not going to say anything negative about them. What's the shame of it is there is people that like WWE and only watch WWE but they rely on the opinions of people who are only going to say negative things about WWE and it forces them to think the same way about something that they're not going to turn away from. And it's like, dude, there was the Balor and Mysterio match was nice. You know, the, the Lesnar Terrence should have part in the beginning was nice. And this was a nice ladies match. And if they're going, they want to go in the direction of a triple threat, which is something I said that they're probably going to do last week to make this more interesting because then you can have Carmella take the pin. Then you can protect Lynch and Belair in that match. It's, a, it's not, oh, oh, it's predictable. So it's not like, like what else are you doing? Who's doing something better than that? If Carmella can wrestle the way she did on Raw this week, and then you have Lynch and Belair in there. To me, that's better than the match that they had triple threat with Asuka, which was a great match. So what the hell's the problem? Absolutely. Spot on analysis. So yeah, this was better than the Money in the Bank match. Um, at the end, after everything was over, Carmella... Taunted Bianca a little bit. Bianca hit the KOD and stood tall at the end. Next up, we have Miz TV with Champa. Champa said he wanted all eyes on him, and there's nobody better to keep eyes on everybody than Miz. And then they eventually get interrupted by AJ Styles. He says, do me a favor, shut your mouth. Now, getting ahead of myself here, Miz actually got obsessed with talking about Logan Paul and how he really wants Logan Paul to... Uh, take back what he said but at the end of the day if he doesn't then he's got a friend nearby that he's gonna have at his side and he looks at Champa so Miz is gonna be with Champa moving forward here then we have Styles coming out he says shut your mouth and then you know he says he sounds like you're the man a man that and then Miz cuts him off he says you know these are the actions of a man he cuts him off again. And then he said, would you let me say what I was going to say? These are the actions of a man who is a coward. Dot, 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 with tiny balls. And then 
Styles comes down, tears down the Miz TV set. Ezekiel enters. He says that Elias used to talk about how phenomenal AJ is, and he wants to be his tag team partner. So here we go. We got tag match now rather than the advertised handicap match against AJ Styles. It's now Ezekiel and AJ Styles versus Miz and Champa. Heels look concerned as we go to a commercial break. What would you think of that Miz TV segment before we get to the match? Can I tell you, man, I don't like this tiny balls thing, man. I think it's very juvenile. I, I, I do think Miz's reaction to it is a little funny where he's looking around and he's all shocked, but I don't, I, I don't know. I just don't like it. it. It it's it's very juvenile. Regardless, pa- moving past that, I thought it was fine. I thought it was kind of good to see Champa get a little, you know, notoriety or a little spotlight on a Miz TV. I thought Styles was actually pretty pretty good and and came out in a good way and and you know did his little lines pretty good and um, I, I liked Ezekiel showing up too. So I, I had no problem with this, man. I thought this was like, it was, it was, it was fun and, and funny. Yeah. The match was pretty good too. They built to a hot tag for styles. Styles came in, ran wild, ended up hitting a gut wrench, uh, gut buster and stinger splash pump handle slam. Went for a cover, got two. Style knocked Champa down from the apron, but Miz took advantage of his distraction, hit a DDT for two. He went for the skull crushing finale, got countered into a fireman's carry uh, neck breaker. Nice looking move by Styles. Ezekiel then took out Champa to the ringside area. AJ locked in the calf crusher, but Champa comes in and ground and pound Styles and gets surprisingly DQ'd for the match. I didn't even see the referee make a five count or anything, but at the end of the day, as they were walking away, were Miz and Champa. Styles hit the phenomenal forearm on Champa when he turned around to look at him from the aisle way. And then we see Riddle and Lashley backstage, and Riddle's excited for their tag match, and he wants... Uh, Bobby to watch Stranger Things with him, but Bobby says he's already watched Stranger Things. So what do you, th- <laughs> you think of the Styles and Ezekiel Champa Miz match? Yeah, I thought it was really good to watch. I just didn't understand the um, the, the ending. Like w- w- that happens all the time where a tag team partner comes in to break up, you know, a pin or whatever. It was like the quickest five count in history or there wasn't even a five count. I, I just didn't understand the ending of it. I And then, you know, one of the funny things that was interesting was at the end, you know, Miz was down at some point and Champa comes over, try to like kind of help him. And Miz is on the ground outside the ring. Champa's like there. And he's like, kind of like, Hey man, get up. You're going to be all right. And then Champa gets hit with the phenomenal forearm. Miz gets up and Miz completely abandons him like the biggest jerk. You know, he just, yeah. he leaves Champa like he's a piece of crap, but Champa was actually, somewhat caring about him and trying to help him. So typical Miz, you know, not getting a shit about anyone but himself kind of thing and using people for his own advantage. It's, it, the, I, I just find that as, those little unnoticed aspects of Miz's character, his selfishness and to be very, uh, very, very humorous. Yeah. I thought the psychology of the match was good though. They got, they let Ezekiel get in a couple baby face moves early. Then he got isolated in the heel corner and they built to the hot tag for AJ. AJ came in, hit all those strikes, that combination he likes to do with the spinning back fist. And he hit that pump handle gut buster. And then the fireman's carry neck breaker. So I thought styles looked good. I thought that his roll into the calf crusher was nice as well. And, you know, Miz and uh, Champa did their job, too. And, you know, Champa may say that Miz draws all the attention, but I would argue AJ draws a little bit more attention than that. So if it's going to be Miz and Champa versus AJ and Logan Paul, I think AJ and Logan Paul are bringing more attention and more eyes to what Champa's involved in than the Miz is, quite frankly. Yeah, there's a lot of people that just know The Miz. Like, I know a woman who's friends with my wife who watches that show, but she doesn't really know anything about wrestling. But she happens, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people that 
just know the Miz from other things, whether it's Dancing with the Stars or this. So you can argue, you know, either way. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, but nobody's it, turning it, on wrestling just because the Miz is on Dancing with the Stars or was on the Real World. Like my wife knows him from him being on MTV, but it's not like she watches anything because Miz is on it. Right. Of course, no one's watching wrestling to watch The Miz, but um, I got it. I get your point. Absolutely. Yeah. More eyes see Miz, but it's not like more eyes on Raw look at Miz. Right. Exactly. Well, Logan Paul, certainly. I mean, how many of his social media, you know, the people that, that watch his channel are like, yeah, I'm going to watch this guy wrestle. You know, I just, yeah, just want to see will. what he does. They will. Yeah. Yeah, of course and, they will. But... Regardless, we got the Riddle stuff backstage, which was, you know, they're still presenting Riddle as a little bit of a goofball, but whatever. Um, you know, more goofy, more goofy last night than than normal than than more normal recently. Yeah, he was a little bit less serious last night in that interaction with Lashley, but whatever. Um. We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back. Remember, guys, on patreon.com slash beyond the mat, you can get rid of the ads. Follow me on Twitter at beyond mat WWE. We'll get into the Alexa Bliss, Asuka versus Two Drop and Nikki Ash match right after this. The Beyond the Mat podcast. We'll be right back. To the Beyond the Mat podcast. All right, so we got Alexa Bliss and Asuka taking on Dewdrop and Nikki A.S.H. We had a pretty good, very short tag match here. We had uh, Nikki Ash hit a blockbuster on to Alexa Bliss, hit a snapmare out of the corner, then Bulldog. They got a hot tag on to Asuka. Oscar ran wild, but ran into Nikki A.S.H. as they both went for a clothesline. Oscar and Dewdrop that ended up in the ring together. Oscar took control with some strikes and a jawbreaker, hit a missile drop kick from the top rope. Nikki Ash tagged in. Dewdrop went for a senton on at ringside, but landed on the mat. Completely missed. Bliss hit the DDT on Nikki A.S.H. And the match was over. One, two, three. So it was short. I don't even know why I said it was good because it really wasn't. But um, I honestly thought that after Bliss and Asuka won, that some kind of turn was going to happen with one or the other. Because we're having turns every freaking other segment now. On mm -hmm. e either show, I thought Bliss was going to turn heel or Oscar, but I guess they need Bliss selling credit cards, so she's not turning heel. And uh, I guess they uh, Oscar is what she is. But do you have anything to say about this match? Um, no. Alexa Bliss's theme song though was finally released on WWE's YouTube page, so that was interesting. It happened came out yesterday. All right. Huh. Good for her. There was a lot of people waiting for that, man. A lot of people just wanted that song and uh, came out yesterday. I, I don't know, man. There, there wasn't much to talk about about the match, honestly. It was very predictable. You know, of course, Nikki took the pin. You know, not much more to it. Yeah. I thought uh, the one thing that was done, Dewdrop sold well in this match. The, you know, there was a point where someone was on the top rope and kicked her and she you know, took a pretty big bump, like, against the ropes and on the ring. So I felt, and then she did the senton on the side, missing it, knowing she's going to miss it. So, you know, do drop yeah, some painful. good painful. Yeah. Painful, man. But it is what it is. You know, hopefully do drop can get back into some singles competition. But Yeah, I agree. We get the Usos and the Street Profits. They're going to be in the match coming up here with Omos joining the Usos and Reggie joining the Street Profits. Usos are basically saying they're going to win. No matter who the hell the ref is, the Profits then tell them 
that Ford shoulder was up at Money in the Bank and that they're going to be winning at SummerSlam. Our truth then comes out and shows everybody that he's a certified tag team counselor and he's a certified referee. Then he starts acting out how he's going to do a three count, acting out how he's going to count somebody out of the ring, which I thought was really funny. Really funny. When he's like, uh-oh, he's not coming. Seven. Uh-oh, we got a problem. Eight. Someone's going to win. Nine. <laughs> that he was, oh, it was great. He was good, man. Then Omos comes out. MVP basically says, pardon the interruption. I saw our truth making a complete fool of himself. I thought the Nigerian giant would be a great referee. So I don't know what, what they're doing here, teasing the two of them being the guest referee. I sure hope it's not our truth or Omos. But, um, you know, the match ends with Omos giving the tree slam to Dawkins while everybody was cleared out ringside. Our truth, you know, got a lot of action in this match. It was nice. We saw Montez Ford do some pretty nice shit with the frog splash. And um, Dawkins hit the 360 splash and things like that. So they, they did all their different stuff. I don't, you know, we, we've all seen the Street Profits and Usos go at it. We've seen what Omos does. And, you know, Reggie basically was the worker in this match that got the hell beat out of him while well, they built for the hot tags to each of the street profits at different times. But, um, you know, that's how it ended. Okay. Dawkins took the pin. What'd you think? Okay. So Omos looked better in this match, uh, than, than he normally looks. I thought he like just seemed to have a little bit more oomph to him. He seemed a little bit more dynamic in the ring. Um, I, I also, I thought it was cool, man. How like, the Usos, you almost felt like they were like considering him as another for another potential member of the bloodline. Like they were nodding their head at him. They're like, ah, oh, yeah, we like this. We like this. We can get down with this giant thing. You know, like it was just kind of an interesting combo that we've never seen before that was kind of just getting together. And I liked that about it. You know, I thought it was just interesting. It's not, you know, look, if Sami Zayn comes out there to team with the Usos, that's one thing. We've seen it. You know, we've never seen this before. And I liked that. And I loved our truth. He was so funny. Um, and, and it was just good to see him wrestling with someone that mattered, not chasing around Tazawa, you know? So I just thought that that was just cool and a little nostalgic with our truth and what's up. And everyone's going, what's up. And when he came out and said, we're after all, we're in San, um, San Antonio, the city of brotherly love. I mean, I, I lost it, man. I was just, cracking up to hear him call San Antonio the city of brotherly love. Um oh uh, yeah that was, was hilarious. There's a lot of cool shit about this. Nah the the R Truth stuff was hilarious. He's called San Antonio the city of brotherly love. And then yeah, you know, we had nice spots. Omos did look a little bit, you know, more agile on this match and he has been looking a little bit better lately in the last couple of times he's been in the ring. He um Picked up, I think, Ford and dropped him on the apron at ringside just before the finish, before he came in and hit tree slam. And they're obviously trying to, you know, keep him, you know, put him over, keep him strong, making him put the pin on Dawkins. I thought it was strange that they had Dawkins eat the pin rather than our truth. But, yeah. You know. It is what it is. You know, there was a point where uh, Dawkins tagged Ford and Ford hit a springboard drop kick. It was real nice coming right out of the corner. But then he got worked into the heel corner and they beat him down. But, um, you know, stereo drop kicks by the Prophets to the Usos at one point looked real nice. And at um, the end of the day, man, they uh, had a nice little tag match here at the beginning of the third hour to lead us into the main event, which was Lashley tagging with Riddle. I thought it was a little bit weird that we originally had the main event, or I don't know if it was main event, but we had the match announced of Theory and Riddle taking on this week, and now it got turned into this tag match, but it was a pretty good match. Lashley started out the match by hitting double flat liners on Rollins and Theory at the same time. 
And uh, Riddle then came in, took out Theory with the knee. Lashley ran Rollins into the ring post. Then we see Dolph Ziggler enter. Riddle got crouched on the top rope. Rollins hit an inverted suplex for a two count. Rollins then worked over Riddle. You know, Riddle continued to get it. It was, you know, they were building a hot tag here for Lashley in the early part of this match. Riddle fought out, but ran right into a sleeper hold. Rollins hit another inverted suplex, locked in another front face lock. This one lying on the ground. Riddle then countered a third inverted suplex attempt and hit a drop down kick to the head. Got him some room. He then countered Theory into an inverted blue thunder bomb. Really nice looking spot. Theory came flying in off a tag. It looked like... Oh, no, he went, bounced off the ropes and somersaulted into him, and Riddle caught him and then hit the blue thunder bomb on him. Then he locked in the bro mission. Theory got out of that. Lashley tagged in, ran wild, hit Rollins ringside. Then he caught Theory, hit the, went, tried to go for the Dominator, but Theory broke out of it. Then he he ran right into a choke slam by Lashley, Really rough looking one too, man. Looked like it hurt. Then Seth got control of Lashley for a minute. He hit the rolling knockout punch and a nice looking frog splash for two. Riddle then tagged in for his hot tag spot. Hit all the Randy Orton stuff, the snap body slam draping DDT. Went for the RKO, but Theory pulled him out of the ring. Peered, pulled Rollins out of the ring and then Lashley speared Rollins ringside threw him into the turnbuckle Theory then went for a roll up but his feet were on the ropes and it looked like he was going to get the three count but Dolph Ziggler threw his feet off of the ropes then Riddle hit the RKO gets the win and Dolph Ziggler enters the ring and super kicks Austin Theory so you know it was a pretty good match here for the main event because they built up for a hot tag for Lashley. Then they built up, you know, Lashley getting beat down for a hot tag for Riddle. Both of them got their stuff in. You know, Rollins got some nice stuff in there too. Theory did his typical thing. And then we obviously had the wild card of Dolph Ziggler sitting there ringside the entire time. And then screwing up Theory's attempt to cheat to win and then super kicking him to take us home off the air. So what'd you think of the match and what'd you think of the Ziggler stuff? Yeah, I thought it was great, great match. And let's face it, either of these two tag teams, if they were actual tag teams, could be the tag team champions of WWE, Rollins and Theory or Lashley and Riddle. I mean, they were they all worked really well together, especially Lashley and Riddle, as you mentioned. Um, one thing that I found interesting was there was a little promo. I don't know if it was right before the match, but um, where Rollins kind of took theory, like put his arm around him and said, let me tell you how to cash in that. Type. It was something like that where Austin theory wanted to know how he should cash in. And Rollins was going to teach him. I thought that was going to lead to something, but it never did. Um, I think it's just the, more of them trying to put in our heads that Theory's going to do what Rollins did when, you know, when he cashed in at WrestleMania 34. I that, noticed some subtleties to that segment, or though. 31, I'm like, sorry. Yeah. I noticed some subtleties to that segment, like when Theory came up to Rollins with the briefcase. Like, we know Rollins isn't really to be trusted from all that Kevin Owens stuff that went down, and this is my best friend, and all that stuff. And Theory went up to Rollins asking for advice, and Rollins was just really eyeing the briefcase. Like, I want that. Like, if you go back and look at it, Rollins is really, like, <laughs> honed in on the briefcase and he's like almost you could tell like trying to figure out a way to get it or, or do something to get it. But he acts like, Oh, I'll be your buddy. And he took some, takes him under his arm and, and they walk away. Regardless of that, um, the match was freaking awesome, man. It was a lot of fun. Four of the best guys you could possibly have in the ring at that time on the show all together. Um, just, just a great thing to watch and, and an awesome outcome with, 
Ziggler helping out and, and then, you know, obviously super kicking theory, which is going to lead to, you know, something, um, something more interesting. And to be honest with you, man, like, I don't care about the fact that we didn't get theory and riddle. I didn't need to see theory and riddle Rollins and theories, the feud that's coming up that it makes more sense to have them in a tag match because theories facing Lashley at the pay-per-view as well. They were in a tag match, the six man tag last week. This week they're in the tag main event. The heels did a good job of beating the hell out of Riddle for a while. Riddle sold real well, got Lashley in there to do his stuff. And then Lashley went ringside. At some point, he did the fireman's carry into the post. I you know, when he does that to people, that look I don't know why other people don't do that same. I know other people run people into the ring post or put them over their head and run them into the ring post. But when he does that fireman's carry and just like helicopters them in their head into the ring post, that looks so painful. And yeah, how is it not painful? And I and I don't understand why there's not anyone else who does that. It's like the only guy who does that shit. But um, it's like a signature. Yeah, I, I like that. But anyway, they they uh you know they built hot tags for both of the baby faces and let them hit all their stuff. So you know I liked it. Um, and then I I'm interested to see. I think what we're getting here is Ziggler's gonna insert himself into the U.S. title situation, and then we're gonna get him another triple threat. You know we're getting all kinds of triple threats here, but we're gonna get a triple threat probably there for the U.S. title, possibly, if he gets himself weaved in there by SummerSlam. And then you have Ziggler, Lashley, and Theory. And if Theory wants to win it back, like you said, he can pin Ziggler instead of Lashley. So that's what I think they'll probably do. And, um, you know, I don't have any problem with it. I think Ziggler somebody... He's one of the best wrestlers around. I understand they haven't presented him that way, but you got to give him a chance to present him that way, to be that way. And that's why I like. I don't understand why people were like, oh, well, we were supposed to get Theory and Riddle, and then we got this instead. Well, this instead was probably better. And, you know, whatever they were going to do with Ziggler other than this is probably not as good as this. So... It is what it is, and I, I, I think it's all good. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of people that try to find a problem with every single thing that this that that WWE does. <laughs> if it was if it was Theory and Riddle, they would say, "Why didn't you involve Lashley in Theory? What what sense does it make to have Theory and Riddle?" So you you can't win with these people. I know it's ridiculous. But I thought it was a pretty good episode, man. And I think we got, you know, a lot of stuff going. Is it the best build to SummerSlam ever? No, because the champion isn't there and he's got Paul Heyman cutting his promos for him. But at the end of the day, I think that the Lesnar and Reigns match will be probably better than, you know, some of the ones we've seen recently. And, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen with the money in the bank. You never know if one title is going to get lost or whatever. So I'm interested to see what's going to happen. You know, they left us on a pretty big cliffhanger there with Dolph Ziggler, regardless of what you think about him. So, you know, I, I get that show. That was a solid show for me. Solid. And happy birthday to Sammy Zane today, by the way. Yeah. Another uh, cancer, just like me. But, um, so we're going to do a trivia question here. You ready? Absolutely.
What was the first women's match ever at a SummerSlam show? Oh, God. I mean, that, that was uh, quite a while ago. Did it involve Lita? No. Did it involve... Oh, my God. Nikki James. Nope. I don't think I'm going to get this. I don't think I'm going to get this, man. All right. Can you guess the year? It's in the 90s. I'm going to guess 1991. It was 1994. 1994 was Alundra Blaze versus Bull Nakano for the women's championship. Wow, man, that's a that's a tough one. Yep. Evidently, uh, Blaze returned retained her gold after hitting a German suplex. So back then, a German suplex was that. Devastating. Nowadays, Oscar just does them all the time. <laughs> but so that's that. Thanks everybody for joining us. Remember, follow us on Twitter at Beyond Matt WWE. Also available on Patreon, patreon.com slash beyond the mat. All podcast and audio platforms, Beyond the Mat Podcast. We'll see you later in the week. Thanks a lot, Brad, for joining us tonight. No doubt. All right. We will catch you guys next time. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Mat. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a show. show, show, show.